Thanks. You'll be relieved to know I brought no slides. I can't believe we're in the 21st century and we're showing slides. Next conference should be how to get rid of slides. Anyway, uh, I'm flattered to have been invited to speak here today. I am uh, no authority on the subject of crisis and creativity, although I will admit that I'm the world's leading authority on how to do the voice of Mr. Burns. Uh, but as you may be aware, we show business folks are, are occasionally no strangers to creativity, and uh, we've been known uh, to have more than our share of crises, although most of those are self-inflicted. <laughs> in, in any case, I've, I've just finished working on a feature-length documentary about why New Orleans flooded. It's called The Big Uneasy. It shows Monday, uh, one day only. And uh, it, it grew out of two experiences uh, that I'd had. As a New Orleans resident whose house was spared, uh, I had energy available that other people were spending on fixing their homes, uh, arguing with insurance companies, and trying to figure out how to get screwed by the Road Home program. Um, and then I started having conversations with, uh, on, on my radio program with the leaders of two separate independent investigations into the disaster, letting them teach me uh, what this crisis taught them. I've also been talking to and reading people who have been thinking creatively uh, about where we go from here. So uh, in what I'm going to say here, I'm deeply indebted and drawing on the work and the thinking of uh, John Barry, uh, Professor Bob Verchick, and uh, New Orleans architect David Wagoner, although, of course, any responsibility for my conclusions rests solely on them. <laughs> First, what was the crisis we experienced here? Well, uh, most media versions treated as a so-called natural disaster. I say so-called because many people in the field of disaster response point out that there is a human component in almost all of what uh, Professor Verchik properly calls naturally triggered disasters. Uh, the Haitian earthquake, to take an example, had it happened in Los Angeles, uh, might well have killed fewer than 100 people. That's a difference in human infrastructure, the difference between strict earthquake codes and letting people live in shanties. Uh, it's also a sociological difference, socioeconomic difference, pardon me, uh, between a country that can afford strict earthquake codes and one that can't. So back to New Orleans. Uh, what we experienced here five years ago this Sunday was a man-made disaster, according to one of the two independent investigations, the greatest man-made engineering disaster since Chernobyl. When you're being compared to Chernobyl, you're playing in the big leagues. <laughs> the Army Corps of Engineers used a model, a statistical model, a standard project hurricane uh, against which to design the hurricane protection system that Congress told them to do to protect New Orleans. Uh, that statistical model treated the most then recent extreme hurricanes as statistical outliers, as improbable, as anomalous and therefore excluded them for the model. So uh, the design of this city's hurricane prote protection system was in a way doomed from the beginning in the late 1960s. When the Corps says they've learned their lesson, we can all agree that they're not excluding Katrina from their model this time around. At least I hope they're not. What the Corps is doing, what they're proud of doing right now, is building bigger and uh, to borrow their trademarked phrase, building strong. That's right, they've trademarked the phrase building strong. If you doubt that, go visit their website. If you're building strong and not having the Corps' approval, you may owe them money. <laughs> building bigger and big, building stronger means basically building larger stationary structures, building static. That's what the Corps does, that's what they're paid to do, that's what they know how to do. When I was growing up in Los Angeles, I noticed this uh, long concrete ditch that coursed through the city. Uh, that, I was told, that is the Los Angeles River. It had flooded in 1937, and the Corps then offered to fix it by encasing it in a meandering sarcophagus. <laughs> nothing, lives, nothing lives in that river except used soap suds expelled from laundromats in the San Fernando Valley. As a show business person, I know theater when I see it. When I uh, see the TSA, for example, making us take off our shoes while until last month all cargo airborne was not being inspected, 
I saw what Bruce Schneier calls security theater. <laughs> the plot of the show was this, if we make you go through enough inconvenience, you've got to feel safe. <laughs> Similarly, what the Corps of Engineers does uh, in its very approach to me is safety theater. We build big walls and you don't see any water anymore, therefore you are safe. Now that wouldn't be much of a problem if we lived in a static environment. The difficulty comes if you're building large static things in a dynamic environment where little givens like oh, sea level are bound to change in the years ahead. That's when you begin to wonder if mounting such a, an expensive theatrical production is really the wisest way to uh, spend our now clearly limited resources. After all, the USA is no Cameron Macintosh. Vertex suggests one of the problems when agencies like the Corps of Engineers do their cost-benefit analyses, they don't have a way to calculate the value, the economic value that natural infrastructure provides to a city. For example, the value that an acre of coastal wetlands has in reducing the ferocity of hurricane winds and storm surge. There's no way of quantifying that, of calculating it, of economizing it, of monetizing it. Yet the absence of that infrastructure service costs us big time, as we're now seeing. John Barry points out that the Corps also did not include in their hurricane protection system cost-benefit analysis any value for the service of that system saving human lives. So the first creative revolution we need in the wake of this crisis is to uh, take the sting out of a sinister Hollywood phrase, we need creative accounting. That is to say, we need to be able to acknowledge and quantify the value nature brings to the table beyond the economic value of the shrimp catch or the submerged oil reserves. Only when we can appreciate and account for the value of natural structures in protecting and preserving our economic, cultural, and other values that are so crucial to the survival of New Orleans can we um, know how to deal with the crises of water that lay ahead of us in this century, either too much water or not enough. Wagoner suggests another source of creative thinking on this subject, the Dutch. Hey, they've only been trying to think about living with water under sea level for about 700 years. They're probably getting pretty good at it by now. And uh, they've been refining, changing, and learning as they go, i.e. being creative in their approaches. Here's how creative the Dutch have been. In 1953, after their big flood, they turned for help to New Orleans. That's right, because New Orleans was the site of the invention of what is still the world's most efficient, most powerful pump, the wood pump. Nowadays, they're uh, well beyond our contribution, the wood pump. See me afterwards if you think the pump is really made out of wood. <laughs> Today, the Dutch message can be boiled down to this. Don't fight a war with water. Water always wins a war. Learn to live with water. Let it add value during the good times and learn to store it and drain it during the bad times. In fact, most of the experts I talked to for my film, and I acknowledge that, uh, as uh, Abby Hoffman once observed, an expert is a talkative guy from out of town. Most of the folks who are authorities in this matter keep advising us the value of mimicking nature. For coastal restoration, for multiple lines of hurricane defense, for all the values that New Orleans seeks to ensure to survive, mimic nature. For a city, for a country, and for an agency that uh, has yoked the notion of progress to drawing or digging straight lines. That's a big leap. But big leaps are what creativity is all about. Thanks very much.